This is fantastic. Jonathan Hickman's Powers of Ten, number two. This whole series continues to captivate my attention. Every issue of this run, I'm convinced more and more that this is going to be one incredible hell of an X-Men tale. But look, even the art team is absolutely blowing this series out of the water. Uh, its style is great. We've got R.B. Silva doing pencils. Uh, he's also doing some inks with Adriano Di Benedetto. As always, Marte Gracia is on colors, and he brings both House of X and Powers of Ten together into kind of a cohesive palette, and you get you get to see both books kind of meld together in its similar nature. A lot of it's because of the colors, in my opinion. Great books, and both of these are just really good. So I was a little bit reluctant to jump into this series because, you know, the past 10 years haven't really been my favorite in terms of enjoying the X-Men books, specifically in terms of continuity, of course. But, but here I am, actually enthralled and wanting more and very excited about every single week. That is really inspiring, to be drawn to an X-Book this way, a similar way that I felt about the Onslaught saga, where, you know, in high school, I couldn't just wait to get that next issue. I wanted so bad to find out who Onslaught was, and with every single issue, it was just intense, you know? I remember reading The Age of Apocalypse. I wanted more, and that's what I find from this book. It's awesome. It really is. So let's pick up where we left off last week. And I'm referring to this page as the turning point. Uh, last week, you know, Hickman brilliantly explained the past few years of continuity issues by revealing that Moira McTaggart is a mutant, capable of kind of a, a groundhog day in her entire lifetime. So, you know, at her death, she transports back in time into her mother's womb every time to start fresh on a different path, a completely different direction in everyone's lives. She becomes the most powerful mutant, guiding the continuity of the entire universe. So we come to find that Moira, she's made many mistakes and she's learned from them. And now she's in her 10th lifetime. She's ready to put all of the cards on Xavier's table, showing him well, every single one of her lifetimes, b before he even forms the X-Men. And like I said, I, I love all of these panels on this page, which was in House of X number one and Powers of Ten number one. Like I said before, this page changes everything. So look, we're gonna have spoilers from this point forward, everyone. We begin this book, uh, Powers of Ten number two, with a quote from Magneto. There's a chasm between you and I, Charles, a gap that cannot be crossed. With each passing day, I fear it never will be. <laughs> and that's great. We walk into this book looking at Magneto's mindset. And, you know, in year number one, this is the year that the X-Men are formed. We see Moira and Xavier, they're visiting Magneto. His reluctance is clear. He's skeptical of Xavier's intentions until he opens his mind to Charles. He lets him show every life that Moira has lived. And upon witnessing those past lives, Magneto, he changes his mind. <laughs> Moira explains, I believe that the one thing I haven't tried yet, all of mutantdom as one, is the thing that means more than just surviving but thriving and assuming our rightful place on this earth. And with that, Eric and Xavier shake hands. <laughs> I love this. So we fast forward 10 years, just like this, this first book, Powers of Ten, number one does. We go to year 10, into the future, and we see that they obtain intel that a what they're calling a mother mold is being constructed in space. It's a mold that creates multiple master mold sentinels. Um, that's disturbing in itself. And Cyclops agrees to have uh, he head up a, a team up to destroy the mother mold in space after learning that this is when Nimrod is brought online. Again, with another jump forward to year 100, we learn that in this 10th Moira timeline, 
the actual leader of the whole Krakoa mutant society is Apocalypse. Now, that was really a shock. <laughs> that was the big reveal in this issue, in my opinion. A couple others in the future as well. <laughs> Even so many more questions spring up from this, I'm telling you. Uh, I'm certain to discuss this in further detail, of course, in uh, future videos. I'm going to kind of leave it for there for now. And we cut to this supposed human-machine alliance, right? And we're shown where Nimrod kills two of his officers brutally. And we're talking about humans. And it actually shows how villainous Nimrod is and how the machines don't respect the humans that are supposedly on their side, right? Surprise, surprise there. And, you know, the question brought up by Apocalypse here is... Why, in every one of these Moira timelines, why is the destruction of mutants by the hands of the Sentinels not avoidable, you know? Why, why is it aimed at mutants specifically? Is this a test of natural selection, he asks, you know? Whether mutants are worthy? Huh, so many even more questions with that as well. Uh, and that's, that's one of those things I love about this series, the questions that I'm having uh, while I'm reading it. As more are answered, we open up more doors. So we fast forward again. A thousand years in the future, we see a glimpse into what has occurred after the technological singularity. The scope of artificial intelligence has reached a huge pinnacle, and just like the passing of time in this series, we now learn that the title, The Powers of Ten, is also a measure of what they call species intellect, or SI for short. We, we get more of these visual graphs here, right? Hickman uses these pretty well in the series, and it shows uh, the powers of 10 applied to species intellect, this SI, where one is machine intellect, 10 is hive intellect, and then 100 through 10,000 are intelligence, and so on. It builds, and, and I've been enjoying these graphs myself. I, I feel like it helps give us a different way of looking at the world that has changed so much from Moira's fourth life, the one that we mostly remember within X-Men continuity. I won't give up too many more details here. I think it's always good to leave a little bit out, because look, this series, it deserves to be delved into, and spoiling everything seems kind of like an injustice for such a good book, and I will mention this. Uh, I'm left with almost a, a creepy feeling about the, the collectivism of machines in year to, uh, 1000. Uh, this all feels so much like we may end up in a, a huge future space battle between us mutants and the machines, you know, a thousand years in the future, so... What have we done? Have we just postponed the inevitable sentinel war here? Um, you know, what matter does more time make if this all still gets flushed away, like every ending thus far? Uh, so many questions, like I said. Will, will Destiny's prediction be true? You know, is Moira's 10th or 11th life her, gonna be her last? Uh, will, will her choices lead up to the prevention of the Sentinel War. I'll tell you what, I'm certainly going to end up reading this whole series, and I hope you do too, if you love the X-Men. Uh, I'd love to hear what you think. Uh, do you have a theory? Hey, leave a comment below. I'd love to hear your hot takes, your theories, your exclamations, or you could even cuss me out if you want. <laughs> leave a comment. I'd love to have a chat with you. Stay tuned for another little glimpse of some great Jim Lee classic X-Men art here right after this. Hit subscribe if you like my content, hit the bell so you can be notified, and once again, like I always say, you are the gateway into comics. Hey, thanks for staying after just to look at some of this fantastic Jim Lee X-Men art. So this is a series of three issues only, and each page just has some more of Jim Lee's art. And I've shown a little bit of this, look, there's Feral, oh gosh, these are so good. Man, this is, and this is classic stuff, I mean... <laughs> You gotta love Jim Lee's stuff. I mean, he was the one that took these characters and just brought them to life in a really powerful way. Quicksilver, Magneto's son. This is just 
This is just incredible stuff. This is the X-Men that I remember. I'm, I'm kind of going through the old Claremont run, and I'm picking and choosing, because I've read it. And I'm picking and choosing the ones that I want to read. I'm also cycling through some of this Onslaught stuff, and I'm on my way up to it right now. I'm looking at um, uh, 328. I just reread this one. Uh, it's really good really good fight uh cycloc versus sabertooth enough said that's absolutely that's absolutely a great issue of course all during that that era was really good issues were being put out i know that they're not as popular as that claremont run but i really liked it i think lobdell did a good job i think uh, mark wade <laughs> even I, I laugh every time i i say mark wade but you know, I think he did some of the regular X-Men there during the Onslaught series. This is right before it. This is like leading up to it. Just some really fantastic art. That's from the cover right there. That picture of Sabretooth. Say picture. <laughs> the, the drawing of Sabretooth Gambit. Absolutely fantastic art in every way. You know, Jim Lee, he's the guy. And of course, you know, if y'all don't know this, I'm sure you do. You know, if, if you're reading the, the new run of the X-Men, you probably know... That, of course, Jim Lee is working over at DC now, and, um, you know, he's one of their top dogs in charge. Not really sure what he does. I kind of alluded to that in another video. I uh, wish he still did a ton of art. Wouldn't that be fantastic? Look at that Toad drawing. I mean, that, like I said, Jim Lee's the guy that really brought Toad to life in a, in a really good way. Look at that. Just fantastic. You, you can't dislike his art. You gotta be a crazy person. <laughs> you know, you gotta be just whacked out of your mind, don't you? Hellfire Club. Man, that's dark. Holy cow. You just gotta love it, you know? I wanna set that as my avatar on Twitter here. Ooh, that looks good. Well, I could sit here and drool over this stuff all day. But once again, you know, I'm really digging this this run, this whole X-Men series. And it's got me just in impassioned about the X-Men again to where I just can't stop thinking about it, talking about it. Of course, most of my videos have been about this and I'm just, I'm super stoked about it. You know, let's talk more about the stuff we love, right? I don't know. That's kind of what I've been doing recently. It seems to be <laughs> making me feel better. You know what I mean? And so once again, guys, uh, thanks for tuning in. I, uh, oh, look at this. This is the danger room there at the, uh, at the very bottom Man, that's cool. Yeah. Well, I'm going to stop drooling over all this. I'm glad you all stopped just to look at these books. You know, I mean, they're all... I've got these for like 25 cents a piece or something. They're so tattered. I just look at them over and over and over because there's no... These aren't worth a, a damn thing, you know? <laughs> they're such such uh, su such bad quality here that it's deteriorated. So look, uh, like I said, I'd love for you to catch me on my next video. I would say the same thing. I'm Chase. I love the X-Men. I love comic books. You're the gateway into comics.